Well, I'm going to introduce our panel in the hopes that this uh, will, will work on the technical side for us. Uh, the next portion of our program reflects the ongoing international work at USEA. In my opening remarks, I mentioned that USEA contributes throughout the globe in partnership with USAID, the State Department, and, uh, the, uh, and uh, the Energy Department. The work is made possible by the dedication of our program directors and their remarkable staff, which travel the four corners of the world, uh, delivering uh, human, a human right, energy access in parts of the world where there has been none or where it is so bad or has been so impacted through political, uh, sociological, or other factors that uh, the energy has not been available, uh, even in the most basic form uh, for most of its people. Uh, you'll learn about these efforts from our panel of uh, very professional players. Um, they, the first is uh, Will Poland, uh, and second, Marjorie Jean-Pierre, and third, Andrew Palmatier. Uh, to introduce the panel, uh, Will Poland is a senior director uh, of the Energy, Te Energy, Energy Technology and Governance Program, or ETAG. Will possesses 30 years of experience directing cooperative programs that support market transformation, energy trade and investment, and technology transfer throughout Europe and Eurasia. Marjorie Jean-Pierre heads our Energy Utility Partnership Program, or EUPP. In this position, she's responsible for managing and implementing partnership activities in Central and South America, the Caribbean, Africa, and Asia. Marjorie has significant experience working on government programs, dealing with energy issues in developing countries, and has traveled extensively throughout the world as part of her uh, obligations and responsibilities, as has our entire panel. Andrew Palmatier manages the US East Africa Geothermal Partnership, or EAGP, the Asia, EDGE, that's Indo-Pacific Energy Market and Investment Modernization Program, and promoting international consensus on oil and natural gas uh, related issues. Andrew has a track record of implementing uh, successful international energy partnerships, uh, and uh, that's throughout the world, and a focus on sustainable resource development, utility uh, sector privatization, and the integration of clean energy projects into the grid. Now you'll hear from all three of our directors. We're incredibly proud of them. The hard work that they do, it's made more difficult in some respects by not being able to be in country uh, and to have that, uh, that hands-on uh, contact that comes with only in-country work. But we, our work continues on unabated with USAID and the other elements of government. After the conclusion of Andrew, the third presentation, I'll offer a few questions for an interactive live Q&A session. Will, please proceed. Director of the United States Energy Association. I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak at this leading world-class energy efficiency forum. Today, I want to talk to you about the opportunities for and challenges to energy efficiency in Europe and Eurasia, which is a bit different, and the issues that it faces are a bit different than the issues we've been discussing here at today's energy efficiency forum. In Europe and Eurasia, we think of efficiency in broad terms as an essential element of the region's energy security. And we address it from both the traditional energy efficiency demand side perspective, as well as in terms of making the supply side cleaner and greener. For over 30 years, USEA has partnered with our friends at the United States Agency for International Development, or USAID, to improve energy security in Europe and Eurasia. Our partnership with USAID over these past three decades provides us with a unique insight into the opportunities for, as well as the obstacles to improving efficiency in the region. But before I begin, let me introduce you to the region because it faces so many different challenges than those that we face at home when we speak about energy efficiency. In USEA's work with USAID, Europe and Eurasia is defined as three distinct subregions that share both a common historical legacy and energy sector characteristics. The Balkans subregion consists of the former Yugoslavia. This is Bosnia Herzegovina, Kosovo, Montenegro, North Macedonia, Serbia, as well as Albania. To the east, the Caucasus subregion is composed of the former Soviet republics of Armenia, Georgia, and Azerbaijan. And the third subregion is the westernmost part of the former Soviet Union. This is Ukraine and Moldova. We also work closely with partner countries bordering these subregions. But for the purpose of this talk, I'll refer mainly to those countries that you see here in yellow. So again, when we think of energy efficiency in Europe and Eurasia, we have to think in broad terms. 
in terms of making the sector cleaner and greener, in addition to the traditional residential, commercial, and industrial demand side interventions that we're so accustomed to. Why is this so different in Europe and Eurasia? Well, it mostly is a uh, because of the unique situation that results from the legacy of the socialist and communist operation of the energy grid during the Cold War era, and because of the recent economic crises that have afflicted the region. There is great potential for tra traditional energy efficiency investment in building stock, in controls, and lighting improvements throughout the region, but there are many challenges that are unique, and we must account for those when considering traditional energy efficiency projects. First, retail tariffs for residential and certain commercial and municipal customers are subsidized in response to energy poverty and the need to maintain cohesion in fledgling democracies. And in this environment, energy efficiency projects have a longer payback period than similar investments in the West. Because of this, efficiency projects in the region today rely almost exclusively on grants and concessional financing for multilateral development banks and bilateral donor agencies. And this largely limits the potential market for energy efficiency projects to the ability to capture grant fund. Tariffs for industrial and larger commercial customers are more reflective of the cost to produce, transmit, and distribute electricity. But, and, and this provides some scope for traditional energy efficiency investment projects, but the hollowing out of the industrial base in the post-Cold War era limits this opportunity to a large degree. To increase the market for traditional residential and municipal energy efficiency, international financial institutions and donors might want to consider increasing grant and low cost support for energy efficiency environmental justice projects, particularly for energy efficiency projects targeted to vulnerable populations such as pensioners and low income communities, and then plan to transition to loans reflecting the true cost of capital as national regulatory authorities gradually increase tariffs. So with this in mind, maybe we should consider um, in the region, with this in mind, and given the, the state of the region's development, maybe we should con con consider interventions on the supply side to be more effective. As, we, as you may know, the region's electricity infrastructure was constructed during the 1960s throughout the 1980s. And as you would expect, it's old, it's inefficient, it's dirty, and it's reaching the end of its useful life. Power generation in much of the region still depends heavily on coal and lignite for fuel, and the plants in the region often lack what we would consider modern emissions control equipment. Likewise, distribution networks designed for the small loads of the Soviet era are stressed as consumers add new electrical appliances and switch to electric heat, increasing technical losses. These same networks will have even greater difficulty in the future as they respond to two-way electric city flows in an era of distributed generation. And this is going to further reduce their efficiency. We estimate that it will require billions of dollars to replace and expand the electricity infrastructure in the region. Until recently, government authorities that administered the electricity sector were unable to generate capital in sufficient quantity to turn over the infrastructure and improve its efficiency. Today, with the assistance of USA, USDA, and the National Association of regulatory commissioners, as well as our partners in Europe, the region is forming national electricity markets to incentivize private investment in energy infrastructure. Reflecting the size of the electricity load in each country, in each, in each country, these nascent energy markets are small, and forgive the pun, but they're balkanized, and they lack the geographical footprint and cross-border interconnections needed to attract the billions in infrastructure investment to improve energy efficiency. As we've seen through our own experience in the United States, expanding electricity markets requires a strong transmission backbone to provide a superhighway for electricity trade. Working in partnership with USAID, USEA established the Energy Technology and Governance Program, or ETAG for short. ETAG works with transmission and distribution companies throughout Europe and Eurasia to promote long-term network planning and analysis. The modeling and analysis supported by ETAG identifies critical infrastructure projects, projects that will tie national networks together and eliminate bottlenecks to cross-border electricity trade. By doing so, we are providing the transmission highway needed to enlarge and expand national markets into sub-regional and regional markets, with the expectation that these large and large markets will, one, create a competition for capital, two, spur clean technology transfer, and three, improve efficiency. 
ETAG studies are examining how transmission companies will integrate greater amounts of wind and solar energy through expanded transmission networks, networks that can pull resources from across the wider region to balance the system when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow. Likewise, we're working with regional distribution companies to help them plan the efficient expansion of their networks and to incorporate rooftop solar and small hydroelectric distributed generation facilities. And we're also working with network and market operators to ensure that their operations are secure in the face of threats to their cybersecurity posed by nation states and criminal hackers. We do this by providing targeted technical support, good old American know-how, and software through a network of sustainable working groups forged and founded in a partnership of USAID and USEA. These working groups provide an American-led forum for regional network planning and the exchange of best practices. They are building the human resource and institutional capacity in Europe and Eurasia to usher in a new regional clean and green, efficient and competitive power industry of the future. And we're already seeing results. Thanks to the partnership between USAID, USEA and NARA, fledgling markets are emerging in almost every country of the region. Market coupling between neighboring countries has begun. And as this has happened, new interconnections are emerging to support cross-border electricity trade within the region and between the region and members of the European Union. Last year, for example, Montenegro established a high voltage connection with Italy via an undersea cable crossing the floor of the Adriatic Sea. This investment connects the emerging Balkans power market with the larger and faster growing Italian market. In Southeast Europe, engineers in utilities are integrating thousands of megawatts of wind and solar projects with the help of ETAG modeling and analysis. Working with ETAG in, in 2014, engineers from the Republic of Georgia commissioned a first of its kind interconnection with Turkey to export its clean hydropower to the Turkish market and beyond to the growing markets of Europe. Today, the same engineers are examining the potential for two more interconnections. Engineers in Armenia are using ETAG's market and network simulation support to investigate a new interconnection with Georgia that would enable its generators and traders to sell excess solar power in Georgia's new day ahead market. And engineers in Georgia are working in cooperation with their partners in Romania on an ETAG funded pre feasibility study which is examining the potential to tie electricity markets in the Caucasus to Europe via a submarine cable crossing the floor of the Black Sea to Romania. Lastly, but certainly not least, least, in one of the most ambitious network projects undertaken in the post-Cold War era, engineers from the Ukrainian and Moldovan transmission system companies are using ETAG models and technical support to synchronize their networks and markets with Europe. If there's one thing I could leave you with, maybe perhaps the most important thing I want to take you to take away, is that none of this would be possible without the gener generosity of the American taxpayer, and most importantly, your contributions, your voluntary contributions to the ETAG program. Your participation and your willingness to share knowledge and experience with your counterparts in Europe and Eurasia demonstrates the best that American industry has to offer to the rest of the world. This work, that ETAG undertakes in cooperation with you, supports cross-border interconnection, renewable energy integration, and more, and more efficient networks. And it's leading to a more efficient and clean power sector in Europe and Eurasia. So on behalf of USAID and USEA, I wanna thank you for your years of generous support and your sharing of best practices with our friends in Europe and Eurasia. I look forward to answering your questions in the Q&A and I thank you for your attention. Good afternoon. My name is Marjorie Jean-Pierre. I'm the program director for the U.S. Energy Association. Um, I'm, I'm very fortunate to be able to join you this afternoon for this year's Energy Efficiency Forum. I would like to begin by thanking Johnson Controls, Alliance to Save Energy, and of course, U.S. Energy Association for giving me the opportunity to present this afternoon on our Energy Utility Partnership Program and on International Energy Efficiency, Security, and Access. The Energy Utility Partnership Program is a cooperative initiative between the U.S. Energy Association and United States Agency for International Development. EUPP works around the world to promote energy security, 
clean energy access, and capacity building to achieve self-reliance. The EUPP strengthens the capacity of utility executives, employees, and USAID assisted countries to achieve the objectives below. In many of our conversations with our overseas utilities, they have understood the need for increased energy efficiency as it continues to be an important element of many of the partnership activities because it is one of the most cost-effective means of addressing environmental energy and economic problems facing developing countries. It is also often the easiest and least expensive way to avoid the need for new power plants, reduce pollutants, and lower a nation's economic demand on energy imports. Um, most of our conversations earlier in our program with our overseas utilities mirrored many of the conversations we we're having with our U.S. utilities in developing their energy efficiency programs. They're focused more on efficient products and technologies, lighting, appliances, thermostats, identifying and changing policies and regulations to enhance utility energy efficiency programs, and creating energy efficiency and conservation programs at, at the utility, commercial, industrial, and residential levels. So with our conversations with our overseas partners, we discussed this as well. In our programs in Brazil, although we started originally with the operator, we moved over a little bit to do some work with our system regulators. And then we are fortunate with our first distribution partnership with Coelba and Salvador Bahia in developing a very um, innovative pilot project where they would go into the low income areas and actually replace the inefficient refrigerators in the homes to no cost to the individuals and replace them with much more efficient refrigerators as a mean of reducing the energy cost to the customer, but also as an incentive for them to pay their bills. With our partnerships with the distribution utilities in Jordan, we assisted them in developing a prototype for efficiency programs for residential lighting, commercial air conditioning, and industrial water pumping. As within the U.S., they're also very aggressive and, and having a program to replace fluorescent bulbs with LED lamps for a small fee that was added to the consumer's bill. We have turned, this is a, just an overview of the current activity uh, region that we're working in. And we have seen that our current work with overseas utility partners has matured towards integrating energy efficiency as it applies to energy security and energy access. Utilities prioritize the need for enhanced security and access and see energy efficiency as a means to achieve those goals. Despite the diverse issues facing the different regions that we work in, all of our utilities recognize the need for improved energy planning to foster energy access and energy security. As a continuation of, of a lot of the work that was done regionally in East Africa to assist in developing regional and national forecasting models, we are uh, working on now the individual national levels for the, for the countries on enhancing power system optimization, working with system modeling, integration of renewable energy, and system stability. Our work in Kenya is with PSCC system modeling to system and planning for future expansions, not only within the country, but also when they are interconnected as they are now with East African Power Pool, but also with more of the neighboring countries as well as our work in Rwanda uh, with regional interconnections and power trading to ensure that they increase their access by uh, 2020, I believe 2025. Going on to our system planning work, this is uh, focusing more on energy efficiency as least cost generation option, energy master plans and integrated resource planning. We recognize under planning that energy efficiency is usually the least cost generation option. And EUPP has shown our overseas partners the need to incorporate energy efficiency into their energy master plans and the utilities integrated resource planning to effectively identify gaps and address them through needed policies, plans, and procedures. Senegal, as with many of our uh, overseas utilities, uh, has an aggressive mandate to be able to uh, increase universal access goals by 2025. And so project management and transmission planning training was needed to effectively and efficiently manage project development and identify gaps in their planning. With our work in Ghana, we helped them uh, develop integrated resource planning and the role of renewables and energy efficiency and the sustainability in those plans. For many years, we've had long discussions with not only our power pools, but also with our regional work in South Asia on the development of cross-border energy exchange. 
our discussions for cross-border energy exchange relies on informing our overseas partners on this increases the efficiency of use of current generation sources, reduces the need for new generation construction, and maximizes cleaner sources of energy and increases energy security. Our regional work with South Asia have, um, has increased and identified ways that the cross-border can efficiently use the energy effectively by uh, relying on the excess of their neighboring countries to supply any energy they might need so that it, they would not need to build additional generation in their country. And our work with our regional power pools have identified how important it is that the collaborative work within the region um, is gone into an, a master plan for the region, but also has assisted them in identifying and improving their environmental guidelines that are more in line with international guidelines. Um, we have been working on this for many years, and we realized that um, developing cross-border electricity exchange maximizes the efficient use of the collective resources of the region, rather than being forced to build additional generation to meet peak demand, generation that oftentimes is underutilized and costly. This is also meant to foster trust and confidence between the neighboring countries. Um, I want to identify some additional activities that we're doing in this area before my time is up and just to highlight the work that has been done. Um, our additional capacity building programs have worked on uh, operations and maintenance, clean energy infrastructure, and smart grids. Our work in Uganda is, uh, has focused a lot on asset management as enhanced uh, operations, and we have worked aggressively to train and certify the employees of Uganda Electricity Generation Company and asset management to improve operations and efficiency. We had a, a, a very successful uh, train the trainers series in Ethiopia with the Ethiopian electricity utility substa on substation operations and maintenance, which was used to help reduce power interruptions and improve reliability of the electro le electric power system, improve efficiency and reduce cost of operating and maintaining distribution substations across the EEE network. Our work in India under our Greening the Grid partnership has resulted in us assisting the government of India to achieve its goal of integrating 175 gigawatts of renewable energy by 2022. The key focus of this capacity building has been on battery energy storage systems with the Indian system operators and regulators to optimize grid operations and improve efficiency. In our uh, program that we've been working on within Latin America and Colombia, we, uh, we have provided additional support to the government for the implementation of an advanced metering infrastructure under a government resolution with a focus on the integration of variable energy sources. Understanding this is a key element of increased energy access and security. And recognizing this, Craig, the regulator in Columbia, emitted regulations for establishing a framework for the adoption of smart meters. As I mentioned earlier, I know this conversation with our overseas utilities will continue on energy efficiency, energy access, and energy security. Many of our partners have very aggressive mandates and goals for increasing energy access within the next, uh, so for some, within the next 10 to 15 years. And they recognize that this cannot be achieved without optimizing system reliability and operations. There will be a need for increased cross-border energy exchange to supplement generation. Um, increased capacity building and system en enhancements to reach a larger population within their respective countries and their regions overall. Again, thank you very much for allowing me to join you this afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Andrew Palmatier, and I'm a program director with the United States Energy Association. I'd like to thank you all for joining us today, and I'd like to especially thank the event organizers, <coughs> uh, Sheila Hollis and, and all the USEA team that worked so hard to put this together, along with our partners, uh, the Alliance to Save Energy and Johnson Controls. It's a, a pleasure for me to be able to uh, speak to you all today. I wish we could all be together in person, like so many of the uh, forums of the past, but um, it's uh, exciting to engage here digitally and uh, to be able to talk to you about some of USEA's uh, work um, on energy efficiency uh, in the developing world. <clears throat> so I, I manage a program uh, that is uh, focused on promoting geothermal energy use in East Africa. And I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about 
uh, that program and one of the projects we've undertaken that's um, exploring innovative approaches to energy efficient power generation um, in Kenya. So a little bit about the program, uh, the U.S. East Africa Geothermal Partnership or EAGP uh, is a partnership between USAID and Power Africa and the U.S. Energy Association. Um, it's funded by USAID and, and Power Africa and USEA does the implementation of the project. Uh, the project launched in September 2012 and has been running since. Um, and its goal is to build uh, local human capacity uh, and uh, provide technical assistance to accelerate the development of geothermal resources in East Africa uh, with a priority focus on Kenya and Ethiopia. Um, just to the right of your screen, uh, you'll see a map that shows um, the spread and, and scope of uh, geothermal resources throughout East Africa's Great Rift Valley. Um, the, the Great Rift extends all the way from the north in uh, Eritrea and Djibouti and Ethiopia down to Mozambique and Zimbabwe in, in the south. Um, and the um, region in the center in Kenya and Ethiopia enjoy some of the highest temperature, highest pressure geothermal resources in the world. Uh, so today we'll focus a little bit on, on Kenya in the center and, and specifically on the Okaria area. I'd like to start by talking about um, why we're, we're talking about uh, developing new power generation at an energy efficiency forum. Um, we in the U.S. are very fortunate to enjoy universal, universal energy access, um, affordable energy access, and to have um, our challenge be slightly different than, than what the developing world faces, um, where we are looking for uh, ways to use that energy more efficiently to maximize the outputs from the energy that we already produce. Um, but in Sub-Saharan Africa, the challenge is, is slightly different. Um, there's a significant underserved demand with about 600 million people uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa lacking access to reliable electricity. Um, on a comparison of the, the generation capacity per capita, um, in the U.S. we have about 3,360 megawatts per 1 million people. Uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, that number is about 91 uh, megawatts per 1 million people. So. The, the scope of their energy uh, challenges is very different from ours, but efficiency will still play a key role in meeting the energy needs of Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, in addition to the, the, the lack of access, uh, there are high tariffs uh, on average throughout uh, the region. Um, the average levelized cost of electricity, according to the World Bank, is about 13 cents per kilowatt hour, which uh, in a developing uh, region is can be prohibitive um, to uh, to access and to, to use of, of energy. Um, compounding these challenges is the fact that six of the world's 10 fastest growing economies are in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, this means that there's uh, huge economic growth, rapid economic growth, and yet um, access to reliable, affordable energy uh, is, is a, a, a detriment or, or a hindrance to that economic development. I'd like to talk briefly about geothermal energy and, and go over uh, the basics of how geothermal energy works for some of you who may not be as familiar. Uh, the infographic here is produced by the U.S. Department of Energy, and I think it's very helpful for visualizing the life cycle of geothermal uh, energy production. Um, basically, geothermal energy is produced by extracting hot geothermal fluid, um, which is represented by the red lines and arrows on this infographic uh, from the Earth's subsurface, and uh, converting that through to electricity at, at power plants through either uh, flashed steam, where, where the geothermal fluid itself is uh, converted into vapor, which is used to turn turbines and generate electricity, um, or through a binary system, whereby the geothermal fluid is used uh, through a heat exchanger to heat a secondary fluid, which is vaporized and turns turbines and, and generates uh, electricity. Um, and then the, the leftover fluid, which is illustrated on this infographic by the blue line, is then re-injected into the reservoir to maintain the long-term viability of the reservoir. I'd like to focus a little bit on Kenya specifically uh, before I talk about the, the particular project. Uh, the geothermal resource potential in Kenya is estimated at over 10,000 megawatts. Um, the current installed geothermal capacity is a little over 800 megawatts, which is about a third of the installed generation capacity in Kenya. Um, the, the government of Kenya plans additional geothermal uh, generation uh, capacity of about 4,000 megawatts by the year 2030. 
um, and that's located on the map to uh, the right here. Um, it's indicated by the red areas, which are the geothermal prospects in the country. And you can see they, they start to the west of Nairobi and run up north uh, all the way to Lake Turkana in the north of Kenya. Um, the geography of, of these resources um, presents some challenges because those northernmost geothermal resources um, have, a, have a, a challenge of accessing the national power grid, which is largely concentrated in the, in the southern area near Nairobi. Um, so today we're going to talk about uh, a little bit about how we can use those resources in a more local context um, to provide benefit to local communities without um, facing some of the challenges of transmission siting and accessing the transmission grid. I want to come back to this uh, infographic as well because what this leaves out is um, the fact that this the, the blue line representing the leftover geothermal fluid and geothermal resource um, is actually quite useful um, and, and can be used in, in what's called direct use uh, geothermal energy production. So um, this is uh, using lower temperature resource, not for power generation, but for manufacturing or heating or uh, agricultural uh, practices that I'll cover in just a moment. So this chart illustrates um, that concept of cascading direct use. So taking the uh, leftover fluid from, a, from power generation and putting it to use before you re-inject it into the reservoir. Um, as you can see, as you move from the bottom left from the original extraction and the power plant, um, up to the right and through the various cycles, you, you are using the heat of the fluid um, in stages, moving from power generation to food processing and refrigeration to home heating and greenhouse heating uh, into a lower temperature, uh, lower thermal need activity like uh, fish farm or aquaculture, and then re-injecting the resource. So really what we're talking about is taking the same resource out of the ground, but extracting as much use and benefit out of it as possible before re-injecting it. Um, and this is the, the efficiency uh, innovations that, that we can realize from geothermal power. I'd like to talk about the Osirian flower farm. This is a project that has been uh, developed over the last 30 years in, in Kenya. Um, it's a 125 acre flower farm in Naivasha, which is near the Okaria geothermal resource area. Um, they operate a 1.8 megawatt ORMAT binary geothermal power plant. Um, which provides electricity for the, the project. Um, and they also utilize steam uh, from a 1.6 megawatt well to heat fresh water for the, to heat the greenhouse through heat exchangers and also to uh, provide CO2 to the greenhouses to stimulate uh, more rapid photosynthesis and more efficient growth of, of the plant. So here you can see a, a photo of the greenhouse growing roses itself. This greenhouse, so excuse me, this uh, farm produces about 30% of the roses exported from Kenya to Europe, which is a, a significant portion of the, the rose market in Europe. Um, bottom left is the binary power plant, binary power plant um, with Ormax technology, and then a, a, a shot of the well profile um, a, a, that was developed for geothermal heat and greenhouse heat. Um, USCA has been working with Osirian uh, on a new project that they're undertaking that builds off of the Osirian flower farm experience called the Osirian Two Lakes Industrial Park. This is a planned geothermal industrial park uh, next to the Osirian flower farm that will uh, serve potential clients including manufacturing companies in the textile industry, food production and food processing companies. Um, and will provide a, a significant number of well-paying jobs to the local community. Um, this industrial park will provide electrical and thermal energy through geothermal and solar resources and our role in this project was with funding from USAID, uh, we produced a study uh, done through USEA member power engineers uh, that looked at the grid stability and grid management plan um, using these hybrid uh, renewable resources, geothermal and solar, um, as well as the thermal needs of the clients that will be uh, occupying the industrial park and provided them with a roadmap to move forward. So it's a very exciting project that's using energy very efficiently. It's using, it's making, taking advantage of the cascading nature of uh, geothermal energy and will serve as a, as a model for the rest of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, really particularly uh, for those countries that have uh, high temperature geothermal resources. Um, I'd like to close by just highlighting that, you know, I, I think broadly today we're talking a lot about energy efficiency. 
um, in the U.S. context. But for me, when we look at developing countries, and particularly particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, they face different challenges. Energy access is the greatest challenge. Um, but that, when coupled with the rapid economic growth that I discussed earlier, means that energy efficiency is all the more important. Um, using the efficient, using the resources efficiently is imperative to providing access to these hundreds of millions of people. Um, and within that, uh, within that region, uh, geothermal direct use and cogeneration has a very important part to play in increasing efficiency. Um, because not only are we talking about the efficient use of electricity, uh, but we're talking about um, direct use applications that accelerate local economic growth, create good jobs locally in those communities, and reduce food insecurity. Um, so uh, on the right, you'll see a few pictures here uh, from uh, we've taken during the course of our projects in, in the Naivasha area. Um, it's located in the National Wildlife Refuge, and there's a significant community of uh, nomadic indigenous people from the Maasai tribe that live uh, right among the, the power plant and the industrial parks. And really, I think that's um, one of the most important parts about these projects is that they can coexist with the local communities. They can uh, exist while protecting and preserving uh, the wildlife habitats. Um, but also employing energy efficiency to, pro to provide much needed energy and electricity uh, for the country. So with that, I will uh, close. Uh, I would like to return to our panel. Uh, I would like to ask you uh, how you are collaborating with each other in these uh, challenging times, uh, since we don't have the, the benefit of getting together in person. But I know you're in continuous interaction and collaboration and some of the steps that we've taken internally. Uh, at USEA to outreach and bring uh, bring our teams together. Uh, could you please address that? Anybody sure. Um, you know, Sheila, it's it's a great it's a great opportunity to work with such uh, wonderful colleagues and under your uh, leadership to bring this coordination and make it possible. There are so many issues that you've heard you heard about uh, during the three presentations that we share in common, and, and I think. You know, related to end user efficiency, uh, related to um, regional interconnection of grids to make them more efficient, to enable more efficient use of resources, and to talk about uh, transmission access, as in the case of uh, uh, Andrew's program, uh, as well as the, the end use of uh, the efficiency that he talked about. So we have, uh, I think, shared experiences with each other um, as these uh, projects have grown and transferred our knowledge to each other. Um, in particular, I can think of uh, the, the network planning work that we've uh, exchanged information on, as well as on cybersecurity. And it's been a great partnership that I think benefits both these, all of three of these programs, but also most importantly, the, the folks that we work for overseas and our, our friends at USAID. Yeah, I think a, a common theme of our work around the world is sharing best practices. and. Um, you know, we're constantly telling our partners overseas about the benefits of learning from the experiences of their peers and learning from U.S. experience. Um, so it's, it would be hypocritical of us to not do the same. And I think it's important that, we, you know, we, we share best practices in, internally. Um, we're a small team and we rely on each other to workshop ideas, share our networks and contacts and constantly uh, tinker with and improve our programs. Um, I've been with USA for a decade, over a decade, um, but I still have uh, the good fortune of being able to pull from the expertise of over 50 years of combined experience at USA between uh, Marjorie and Will here. And, um, you know, they've given me invaluable advice and guidance that have helped our programs over the years. Um, you know, one example would be, uh, you know, traditionally a lot of my programming was based on the peer-to-peer -peer volunteer uh, short-term exchange model. Um, where we would do one or two week exchanges of uh, utility uh, experts from the US with their counterparts overseas. And um, those have been very effective, but you know, through conversations with Will and talking about his program, um, yeah, I learned a little bit about what they're doing with these longer term subject focused uh, working groups and some of the benefits of having that long term engagement. Um, so we've uh, implemented sort of a mixed model uh, of the short term engagements and the longer term peer working groups in a a program that's uh, funded by the Department of Energy in India, and I think with, with great results. Um, so it's uh, a constant learning and, and trying to improve in order to better serve our partners overseas. Uh, Sheila, I also want to add that although we're working in different regions, we're finding that a lot of the subject matter that we're discussing is very common. 
throughout. Um, as Will mentioned earlier, um, there was a, a proponent that he started in Sub-Saharan Africa with a transmission planning that is still actually going on today. And it was due to a company that Will uh, exposed us to that has fantastic relationships in Sub-Saharan Africa. And that work is continuing now, even though that program ended about four or five years ago. So we're always here to share best practices, um, the willingness of the US companies and overseas utilities to share mm -hmm. what they're learning with the overseas utilities is instrumental to the success of this program and uh, us being able to kind of uh, bounce ideas off of each other and uh, utilize all best practices that everyone can for all their overseas utilities. It's, it's hard to do that. Pardon me, go ahead. Pardon it's, me. It's, it, you know, one of the funny challenges of this job is that it's hard to share best practices with each other when you're on an airplane. Uh, my job description actually says I could be on travel 50% of the time. And uh, in some years I've come close to that. But nevertheless, we've been, you know, because we're such a tight knit group and uh, we're, we know each other so well, we can, we can do this kind of uh, sharing of best practices and leverage our experiences, uh, even at long distances and during COVID. And uh, let me say also that as far as the travel goes, we have hosted multiple, multiple delegations from all over the world and, uh, and engage them directly with the utilities who may have worked in country, but also with the regulators, with, with the understanding of the way our system works to build, uh, to build awareness of, of a system of government which uh, supports, accommodates, and encourages uh, efficient uh, energy production and availability uh, to a populace that either has almost no energy or very grossly inadequate and unreliable energy. So I think uh, it's, a, it's been a two-way street. And uh, for those of you in the industry who have been kind enough to devote your time and meet with the delegations over the years, we are incredibly grateful to you uh, as well. As, and additionally to the utility players who have gone uh, in country and worked extensively on the ground and helped bring home major projects and, and taken time out of their lives and with the support of their companies uh, and entities who uh, employ them, they have, uh, it's been, uh, it, takes a, it, 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 it takes a village. And I can honestly say that the energy industry in many ways, despite its com competitive nature, it's a very tough and rough and run, rumble nature. Uh, has really, really come together so many years to help bring this home. And I, and I attribute much of that to Barry and his leadership and personality and outreach capabilities, as well as to our wonderful team here. So thank you all. Uh, what are the greatest challenges that you see coming up with respect to meeting these desperate needs for energy still in major parts of the world? What, are, what, are, what, are, what is it? Is it politics? Is it money? Is it all of the above? I would say, Sheila, um, it's probably a little bit of all of the above in some areas. Um, energy access is key to a lot of the regions that we work in, and they understand that's a key driver to not only independence, but also development. But um, within that is also understanding that you have to build the infrastructure that's necessary to be able to have this access. It's not just going out and building additional generation and thinking that's going to solve the problem. Within that, you have to go all the way down the the chain is saying, okay, as we build this generation, do we now have the transmission capability to, you know, to do all this generation? It's also incorporating the, uh, the supplies of the excess of your neighboring countries. And that's a lot of the discussion we've having with the cross-border energy exchange, being able to utilize those resources instead of having to build generation because either you don't have the funding for additional generation or you just don't have the, you know, the capacity to be able to do that. Um, and so that's part of the economic aspect of it as well as a lot of these developing countries do not have the financial ability to build all these large generation projects. So this cross-border energy exchange and being able to use uh, excess capacity from your neighbors is, is key. So I think it's a mix of a lot of things and being able to say that energy access is, um, is key to not only a lot of the uh, utilities, but also in the development of a lot of developing countries that we work with. So it's a lot of factors in my opinion. Yeah, money plays a big part of it, um, and and the and the time as well to develop the infrastructure. And um, in the developing world, uh, they're going non OECD countries are going to account for most of the projected growth in energy demand in the next 15, 30 years. 
Um, and, and so finding more innovative ways to use energy, to get energy and electricity to people, um, for example, the, the project I discussed in, in my presentation, I think is key, um, but also using the, the existing electric uh, patent generation resources more efficiently, as well as the transmission resources, as Marjorie and Will talked about. We need uh, all of the above in, in efficiency as well, um, not, not just in uh, sources of, of electricity and energy, but uh, we need to look at uh, a holistic, take a holistic view of the sector. All right. In, uh, uh, well, yeah, thanks, Sheila. And I think in Europe and Eurasia, it's a little bit different. There, I think, are two critical issues here. One is affordability, uh, and affordability relates to the need to almost rebuild the sector. The sector was, is, you know, as I said in my presentation, was built in the 1960s through the 1980s. From the 1980s onward, there's been minimal maintenance. There's been little built. Uh, and uh, there's been sort of a, a, a system of eating your, your seed corn. Uh, and so you, you have to, we have to be able to generate enough private capital to bring, to come in and refresh the system and make it more efficient. The second challenge I think is that because the systems are so weak, they're subject to the malign influence of actors outside the region that want to compromise energy for geopolitical reasons. And here I'm talking about our, uh, the region's neighbor to the east in Russia, and also to a certain degree, China, who is employing the Belt and Road Initiative as a kind of uh, development debt trap where they'll grant or provide loans for infrastructure. And then if the countries are unable to pay back, they'll take an asset uh, similar to the way that Russia has done. So we see that markets be, are, are critical. Markets in the way that they've worked so well in the United States, as you said, uh, the experience that we've had and we share it with the rest of the world bringing private capital in through transparent and competitive markets to be able to create the environment that will refresh the infrastructure and bring in technical uh, trans bring in tech transfer and efficiency. Thank you so much to our panel. It's pretty clear that um, energy is a human right and energy is a universal language. It's needed everywhere. The cleaner, the better, the more efficient, the better. And uh, this is a remarkable statement about the United States commitment to making the world a better place through these activities, through working uh, so hard to enable the uh, countries of the world, the peoples of the world that do not have adequate access to energy whatsoever. And those who do to uh, improve their energy system so that they're cleaner, more efficient, more affordable, more available uh, across the board. So I thank our wonderful panel. Thank you for all the years you've spent on airplanes away from loved ones uh, and in country for very extended periods of time. We're very proud of you and for all of the staff of the USEA who have been a part of that, that have built this incredible backbone. And thank you to our utility partners and to thank you to through administration after administration, the dedication and commitment to it, making the world a better place. It's not a political issue, it's a life issue for much of the world. So thank you to all who have been in, involved and have, have really carried the ball for us uh, in this important in, and, uh, and really earth-changing uh, effort. Thank you so much. <laughs>